with what you read in the media. I'm not talking about Die and Fergie, but about the important stuff, the politics and economics. Has it ever occurred to you it could be a system of propaganda designed to limit how you imagine the world? Well, that's the view of Noam Chomsky, who's been teaching here in Boston for the past 30 years. Described as America's leading dissident, he's based at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where, although it's very cold, it isn't exactly the Gulag archipelago. As a working journalist myself, I've come to talk to Professor Chomsky about bias in the media. Orwell's Nightmare, a place where propaganda rules, where thought is controlled. Comrades, attention! Here is a special bulletin from the Ministry of Peace. It's now a familiar, if chilling, Cold War fable. Most of us would say it's old hat. But is it? The thought police are joining you. The chief job of a newspaper is to inform. To tell people For decades, the freedoms of thought and expression have been central to Western democracy. The media sees itself as free, fearless, stroppy. And for many in power, the press are too strong. So the idea that Orwell's warning is still relevant may seem bizarre. But not to Noam Chomsky, who thinks the image of a truth-seeking media is a sham. Chomsky has devoted his life to questioning Western state power. Having virtually invented modern linguistics by the age of 30, Chomsky joined the gathering swell of protest in the 60s. I'm Noam Chomsky. I'm a, on the faculty at MIT, and I've been uh, getting more and more heavily involved in anti-war activities for the last few years. Since then, Chomsky has championed a brand of anarchism, becoming deeply hostile to established power and privilege. And in recent years, he's refined what he calls the propaganda model of the media. Well, on a brighter note, commercial break. The government has now... He claims that the mass media brainwash under freedom. Not only do the media systematically suppress and distort, when they do present facts, the context obscures their real meaning. About every thousand miles ain't asking too much, is it? You might wish to uh, stay on and listen. The invasion of East Timor by the Indonesian army caused indescribable slaughter. Hundreds of thousands died. But it was more or less ignored by the mainstream Western media because, Chomsky argues, we were selling arms to the aggressors. But wars where the West's interests are directly involved get a different treatment. For Chomsky, coverage of the Gulf War was servile. Trivial criticisms were aired. Fundamental ones were ignored. Well, hello. Andrew Mark, very nice to see you. Hi. Naturally, um, Chomsky has numerous critics. Which chair has been allotted? Is the media so influential? I'm over here. Okay. Have dissident views really been excluded in an age of relative media diversity, in the age of the internet? Right. Um, this is one of. What about Chomsky's own access? Okay. What about this very program? Okay, Andrew, in your own time. Professor Chomsky, could we start by? Uh, listening to explain what the propaganda model, as you call it, is. For many people, the idea that propaganda is used by democratic rather than merely authoritarian governments will be a strange one. Well, uh, the term propaganda fell into disfavor at the t uh, around the Second World War, but in the 1920s and the 1930s, it was commonly used and, in fact, advocated uh, not by leading intellectuals, by the founders of modern political science, by... Uh, Wilsonian progressives, and of course by the public relations industry, as a necessary technique uh, to overcome the danger of democracy. The institutional structure of the media is quite straightforward. We're talking about the United States, but it's not very different elsewhere. The, uh, the major, there, there are sectors, but the agenda-setting media, the ones that sort of set the framework for everyone else, like the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on, uh, these are major corporations parts of even bigger conglomerates, like other 
in corporate institutions, they have a product with, and a market. Uh, their market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. Their product is privileged, relatively privileged audiences, more or less. So they're, they're selling audiences to They're other selling privileged audience. These are big, business, big corporations selling privileged audiences to other corporations. Now the question is, what, would a ra what picture of the world would a rational person expect to come out of this structure? And then we draw some conclusions about what you'd expect, and then we check, and yes, that's the picture of the world that comes out. And is this anything more than the idea that basically the press is relatively right-wing, with some exceptions, because it's owned by big business, which is a truism, mm -hmm. is well known? Well, I would call the press relatively liberal. Here I agree with the right-wing critics. Uh, so especially the New York Times and the Washington Post, and f which are called, <clears throat> without a trace of irony, the New York Times is called the establishment left in, say, major foreign policy journals. And that's correct, but what's not recognized is that the role of the liberal intellectual establishment is to set very sharp bounds on how far you can go, this far and no further. Give me some examples of that. Well, let's take, say, the Vietnam War, the, probably the leading critic, and in fact one of the leading dissident intellectuals in the mainstream is Anthony Lewis of the New York Times, who did finally come around to opposing the Vietnam War about 1969, about a year and a half after corporate America had more or less ordered Washington to call it off. Uh, and his picture from then on is that the war, as he put it, began with blundering efforts to do good, but it ended up <clears throat> by 1969 being a disaster and costing us too much. So what would, well, the non the criticism. what would the non-propaganda model have told Americans about the Vietnam War at the same time? Same thing that the mainstream press was telling them about Afghanistan. The United States invaded, South had first of all in the 1950s, had set up a standard Latin American style terror state which had massacred tens of thousands of people, but was unable to, main to control local, a local uh, uprising, and everyone knows, at least every specialist knows that's what it was. And when Kennedy came in in 1961, they had to make a decision because the government was collapsing under local attack. So the U.S. just invaded the country. In 1961, the U.S. Air Force started bombing South Vietnamese civilians, authorized napalm, crop destruction. Then in 1965, January, February 1965, uh, the next major escalation took place against South Vietnam, not against North Vietnam. That was a sideshow. That's what the, an honest press would be saying, but you can't find a trace of it. Now, if the press is a, a censoring organization, um, tell me how that works. Is the, you, you're not suggesting that um, proprietors phone one another up no. or that many journalists get their copy spiked, as we say? It's um, actually Orwell, <coughs> you may recall, has an essay called Literary Censorship in England, which was supposed to be the introduction to Animal Farm, except that it never appeared in which he points out, look, I'm writing about a totalitarian society, but in free democratic England, it's not all that different. And then he says uh, uh, unpopular ideas can be silenced without any force. And then how, he, how? He, gives two he gives a two-sentence response, which is not very profound, but captures it. He says two reasons. First, the press is owned by wealthy men who have every interest in not having certain things appear. But second, the whole educational system from the beginning on through just ex gets you to understand that there are certain things you just don't say. Well, spelling these things out, that's perfectly correct. I mean, there, it's the first sentence is what we expand this on. Is, this is what I don't get, because it, it suggests that, I mean, I'm a judge, people like me are self-censoring. No, not right. self-censoring. Uh, there's a filtering system that starts in kindergarten and goes all the way through. Uh, and it it's not, doesn't work 100%, but it pretty effective. Uh, it selects for obedience and subordination. Uh, and especially, I think that's... So, so, so stroppy people won't make it to positions be of influence. Behavior problems or... You know, if you read uh, applications to a graduate school, you see that people will tell you he's not... Uh, he doesn't get along too well with his colleagues. You, you know how to interpret those things. I, I, I'm just interested in this because <clears throat> I was brought up, like a lot of people, um, probably post-Watergate film and so on, to believe that journalism was a crusading uh, craft and that there were a lot of um, disputatious, stroppy, difficult people in journalism. And I have to say, I think I know some of them. Well, I know some of the best and best known investigative reporters in the United States. I won't mention names because I'm like, whose attitude toward the media is much more cynical than mine. In fact, <clears throat> they regard the media as a sham. 
and they know and they consciously talk about how they try to play it like a violin. If they see a little opening, they'll try to squeeze something in that ordinarily wouldn't make it through. Uh, and it's perfectly true that the majority, I'm, I'm sure you're speaking for the majority of journalists who are trained, have it driven into their heads that this is a crusading a uh, profession, adversarial, we stand up against power, a very self-serving view. Uh, on the other hand, in my opinion, I hate to make a value judgment, but the better journalists, and in fact the ones who are often regarded as the best journalists, have quite a different picture, and I think a very realistic one. How, how, can, you, how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know don't that journalists self -censoring. are... I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. We have a press which has, seems to me, a relatively wide range of view. There is a pretty small-c conservative uh, majority, but there are left-wing papers, there are liberal papers, and there is a pretty large offering of views running from the far right to the far left for those who want them. I don't That's see how a propaganda model can... That's not quite true. I mean, there have been Why good not? studies of the British press, and you can look at them by James Curran as the major one. Uh, which points out that uh, up until the 1960s, there was indeed a kind of a social democratic press which sort of represented much of the interests of working people and ordinary people and so on. And it was very successful. I mean, the Daily Herald, for example, had not only more, uh, it had far higher circulation than other newspapers, but also a dedicated circulation. Furthermore, the tabloids at that time, the Mirror and the Sun, were kind of labor-based. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, by the 60s, that was all gone. Uh, and it disappeared under the pressure of capital resources. What was left was overwhelmingly the sort of center to right press with some dissidents. It's true. I but, mean, but, I mean, we've got, are, I would say, a couple of large circulation are, newspapers which are left of center well, and which are, which are, put, you know, putting in um, neo-Keynesian views which the, you call the elites, are strongly hostile to. It's interesting that you call neo-Keynesian left of center. I'd just call it straight center. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> I mean, not left of center is a value term, but meaning. Sure, you could. But there's there's uh, and and you uh, there uh, like very there are extremely good journalists in England. A number of them they write very honestly and very good material. A lot of what they write couldn't appear here. On the other hand, if you look at the question overall, I don't think you're going to find a big difference. And the few st there aren't many studies of the British press, but the few that there are have found pretty much the same results. And I think the better journalists will tell you that. Uh, in fact, we can get, what you have to do is check it out in cases. So let's take, say, what I just mentioned, the Vietnam War. Uh, the British press did not have the kind of stake in the Vietnam War that the American press did because they weren't mm -hmm. fighting it. So just check sometime and find out how many times you can find the American war in Vietnam described as a U.S. attack against South Vietnam, beginning clearly with outright aggression in 1961 and escalating to massive aggression in 65. If you can find... 0.001% of the coverage saying that, you'll surprise me. Well, and in a free press, 100% of it would have been saying that. Now, that's just a matter of fact. It has nothing to do with left and right. Let me come up to a more modern war, which was the, uh, the Gulf War, mm -hmm. which, um, again, you know, looking at uh, the press in Britain and watching television, including some American television, I was very, very well aware of the anti-Gulf War dissidents, mm -hmm. the, 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 the no blood for oil, Campaigns. That's not the, and I the that's not the dissidents. No See, blood in for fact, oil isn't the dissidents. Uh, the the mo no the, the uh, Saddam Hussein's attack on Kuwait took place on August second. From August, within a few days, the great fear in Washington was that Saddam Hussein was going to withdraw and leave a puppet government, which would be pretty much what the U.S. had just done in Panama. The U.S. and Britain therefore moved very quickly to try to undercut the danger of withdrawal. By late August. Uh, negotiation offers were coming from Iraq, calling for a negotiated Iraqi withdrawal. The press wouldn't publish them here. It never published them in England. Uh, it, uh, th it did leak, however. It, there was a great Can debate I, about whether there no, should have been a negotiated sorry, settlement. No, that was not a debate. There was a debate about whether you should continue with sanctions, which is a different question. Because the fact of the matter is we have good evidence that by, late, by mid or late August, the sanctions had already worked because th these stories were coming from high American officials in the State Department, former American officials like Richard Helm. Uh, they couldn't get the mainstream press to cover them, so, but they did manage to get one journal to cover them, Newsday. That's a suburban journal in Long Island, the purpose obviously being to smoke out the New York Times, because that's the only thing that matters. 
it came out in Newsday, and this continued, I won't go through the details, but this continued until January 2nd. At that time, the offers that were coming were apparently so meaningful to the State Department that State Department officials were saying that, look, this is negotiable, meaningful, maybe we don't accept everything, but it's certainly a basis for negotiated withdrawal. The press would not cover it. Newsday did. Uh, a few other people did. I have a couple of op-eds on it. And to my knowledge, you can check this, the first reference to any of this in England is actually in an article I wrote in The Guardian, which was in early January. You can check and see if there's an earlier reference. Okay, let's look at one of the other key examples, which you've looked at too, um, which would appear to go against your mm -hmm. idea, which is the Watergate. Watergate affair. is a perfect example. Where we've discussed it at length in our book, in fact, and Indeed. elsewhere. Indeed. It's a perfect example now, of the way the press was subordinated to power. But this, in fact, th this brought down the me, president. Let me give you an, just a minute. Let's take a look. Uh, what happened there, uh, here it's kind of interesting because you, know, you can't do experiments in history. But here, history was kind enough to set one, us, set, set, set one up for us. Uh, the Watergate exposures happened to take place at exactly the same time as another set of exposures, uh, namely the exposures of COINTEL Pro. Oh, sorry, you have to explain it's, that. To it's me. interesting that I have to explain it because it's vastly more significant than Watergate. That already makes my point. Uh, COINTEL Pro was a program of subversion carried out not by a couple of petty crooks, but by the National Political Police, the FBI, under four administrations. It began in the late Eisenhower administration, ran up till... This is the, aimed at the Socialist Workers Party no, in America. The Socialist Workers Party was one tiny fragment of it. It began, uh, by the time it got through, I won't run through the whole story, it was aimed at the entire new left, at the woman, women's movement, at the whole black uh, 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 movement, it was extremely broad. Its actions went as far as political assassination. Now, what's the difference between the two? Very clear. In Watergate, Richard Nixon went after half of U.S. private power, namely the Democratic Party, and, and power can defend itself. So therefore, that's a scandal. He didn't do any. Nothing happened. Look, I was on Nixon's enemies list. I didn't even know. Nothing ever happened. None, but, none, uh, but nonetheless, you wouldn't say it was an insignificant event. To no, bring it, down was a a president it was a case power. where half of U.S. power defended itself against a person who had obviously stepped out of line. Uh, that's so, and, and the fact that the press thought that was important shows that they think powerful people ought to be able to defend themselves. Now, whether there was a question of principle involved happens to be easily checked in this case. Uh, one tiny part of the COINTEL Pro program was itself far more significant in terms of principle than all of Watergate. And if you look at the whole program, I mean, it's not even a discussion. But you have to ask me what COINTEL Pro is. You know what Watergate is. There couldn't be a more dramatic example of the subordination of the educated opinion to power here in, the, in England as well as the United States. I know you've concentrated on uh, foreign affairs. And, and some of these key areas, uh, mm -hmm. the things we've been talking about. a lot about domestic policy. But, well, uh, I'd like to come on to that, because it still seems to me that on a range of pretty important issues for the establishment, there is serious dissent. That's right. um, Gingrich um, and his neoconservative agenda in America um, has been pretty savagely lampooned. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, apparently um, fixed succession for the Republican candidacy at the presidential election has come apart. Uh, Clinton, who is a powerful figure, uh, is having great difficulty with Whitewater. Everywhere one looks, one sees disjunctures, uh, openings. Within a spectrum so narrow uh, that you really have to look hard well, to find well, it. Well, let me, let me can, give can, it, can, can I just stop you there? Because, because you say the spectrum is narrow, but on the one hand, let me we've, got, we've, we've got flat, can I tax, flat tax Republicans mm -hmm. right the way through to relatively big state Democrats. Find one. Big, big Find state. a big state Democrat. The position now is exactly what Clinton said. The era of big government is over. Big government has failed. The war on poverty has failed. We have to get rid of this entitlement business. That was Clinton's campaign message in 1992. That's the Democrats. Uh, the, uh, the diff what, what you have now is a difference between sort of moderate Republicans and extreme Republicans. Actually, it's well known that there's been a long-standing sort of split in the American business community. It's not precise, but it's sort of general. Between high-tech, uh, capital-intensive, internationally-oriented business, which tends to be what's called liberal, and lower-tech, more nationally-oriented, li more labor-intensive industry, which is what's called conservative. Now, between those sectors, there have been differences. And in fact, if you take a look at American politics, 
it oscillates pretty much between those limits. There's good work on this, incidentally. The person who's done the most extensive work is Thomas Ferguson, who's a political scientist. Here. One, one more example which will have some resonance in, in Britain and Europe is the great argument over the North American Free Trade Association, mm -hmm. the NAFTA argument, where if, an interesting one. If, if there is something which one could describe as um, a global opposition movement, that is, mm -hmm. uh, trade union, environmental, community-based, mm -hmm. then it was certainly present in the anti-NAFTA. Um, Shall I tell you what argument. happened? Well, Shall I tell you what happened? All, all I was going to say is that, that those reported. arguments were well, you no. know, we were well aware of those that arguments. That is flatly false. They were not permitted into the press, and I've documented this. I'll give you references if you like. We, could, we, we read all the pages yes. in Britain, is all I would no, say. I did not. For you example, did. Sorry, oh, let me ask, did. Well, let me ask you, did you read the report of the, of the Office of Techn Technology Association of Congress? Well, did I, you, sorry, did you read the report of the Labor Advisory Committee? Well, I, did, I don't get these sorry. reports, but I, no, read, no, I, read, I read many articles about the anti-NAFTA argument. I'll tell you what you're... Very, I'm sorry. Very vivid stuff. Well, if you're interested in the facts, I'll tell you what they are, and I'll even give you sources. The, uh, the NAFTA agreement was signed more or less in secret by the three presidents in mid-August uh, of the, at the time of the Congress, right in the middle of the presidential campaign in mid-August. Now there's a law in the United States, 1974 Trade Act, which requires that any trade-related issue be submitted to the Labor Advisory Committee, which is union-based, for assessment and analysis. It was never submitted to them. A day before they were supposed to give their final report in mid-September, it was finally submitted to them. They were infuriated. The unions are very right, pretty right wing, but they were infuriated. They had never been shown this. They had strong, they, even at the time that they had to write the report, they were given 24 hours to write the report. They didn't have time to look at the text. Nevertheless, they wrote a very vigorous uh, analysis of it with alternatives presented, saying, look, we're not against NAFTA, we're against mm -hmm. this version of it. They gave a good analysis. It happened to be very similar to one that had been given by the Congressional Research Service, the Office of Technology Assessment. None of this ever entered the press. The only thing that entered the press was the kind of critique that they were willing to deal with. Uh, Mexico bashing, uh, right-wing nationalists, and, you know, and so on. That entered the press, but not the critical analysis of the labor movement. Well, now, so, it, I mean, somehow, by process of osmosis or something, I picked you, up quite a lot no, of anti-NAFTA arguments yeah, and, on the and basis I'll, of worker right. protection, environmental degradation. Yeah, may I continue? This goes on in the press right until the end. Uh, by the end, there were, there were big popular movements opposing it. It was extremely hard to suppress all of this, to suppress everything coming out of the labor movement, out of the popular movements, and so on, but they did. At the very end, it had reached such a point that there was concern that they might not be able to ram this through. Now, take a look at the New York Times and the Washington Post, say the liberal media and the, and the national ones in the last couple of weeks. And I'll tell you, I've written about it and tell you what you find. What you find is 100% support for NAFTA, refusal to allow any of the popular arguments out, tremendous labor bashing. Can I come back to make sure that I understand the, the point about the liberal press as against the conservative press? Because in Britain, over the last two years, um, politicians I come across are um, deeply irritated, ranging on furious, about attacks on them in the press, day mm -hmm. after day, um, on issues which have come to be known as sleaze. Um, they feel That's that right. they are harassed, that they are misunderstood, and that the press has got above itself, is uppity, and is destructive. Mm -hmm. That's the message that they are giving to us. Now, are you saying that that That's whole true. process same doesn't here. matter, uh, as sure. it were, because it's, it's all part marginal. of the same... I mean, when the press... The same thing is true here. When the press focuses on the sex lives of politicians, reach for your pocket and see who's pulling out your wallet. I mean, because those are not the issues that matter to people. I mean, they're very marginal interest. The issues that matter to people are somewhere else. So as soon as you hear, you know, the press and the, and the presidential candidates and so on talking about values, as I say, put your hand on your wallet. And you know that something but, else has happened. But, it, but, but it's been much more than, certainly with us, it's been much more than, than, than uh, bed hopping. It's, it's also been about uh, taking money. Corruption, it's been about the corporations sure. paying for yeah, the Corruption, the parties, corrupt judges, well. fine topic. Uh, corrupt parties? Big, big, yeah, corrupt party. Big business is not in favor of corruption, you know. And if the press focuses on corruption, Fortune magazine will be quite happy. They don't care about that. They, uh, they don't want the society to be corrupt. They want it to be run in their interest. That's a different thing. Uh, corruption uh, interferes with that. So, for example, when I was, let's say, I just happened to come back from India, uh, the Bank of India released an estimate, economists there tell me it's low, that a third of the economy is black. 
meaning mostly rich businessmen not paying their taxes. Well, that makes the press, because in fact, certainly transnationals don't like it. They want the system to be run uh, without corruption, robbery, bribes, and so on, just pouring money into their pockets. So yes, that's a fine topic for the press. On the other hand, the topics I've talked about are not fine topics, because they're much too significant. What would um, a press be like, do you think, without the propaganda model? What would we be reading in the papers that we don't read about now? I've just given a dozen examples. Uh, on every example that, incidentally, you've picked, I haven't picked. I mean, I could pick my own, but I'm happy to let you pick them. On every one of those examples, I think you can demonstrate that there's been a severe distortion of what the facts of the matter are. This has nothing to do with left and right, as I've been stressing, and it has left the population pretty confused and marginalized. A free press would just tell you the truth. This has nothing to do and, with and, left and, and right. And, and given the power of um, big business, the power of the press, what can people do about this? They can do exactly what people do in the Haitian slums and hills, organize. In Haiti, which is the most, take that, most, most the poorest country in the hemisphere, they created a very vibrant, lively civil society in the slums, in the hills, in conditions that most of us can't even imagine. Uh, they, we can do the same much more easily. You've got community activists in, in America. Yes, You've got, not, I'm not talking about the communi so-called communitarian movement, but I'm That's talking about the local community activists and writers place. all over the place. All over the place. Take, say, a city like Boston. And the way all happened. sorts of people, they don't even know of each other's existence. Uh, it's, there's a very large number of them. Fa I, one of the things I do constantly is run around the country giving talks. Uh, one of my main purposes, and the purposes of the people who invite me, is to bring to people together people in that area who are working on the same things and don't know of each other's existence because the resources are so scattered and the means of communication are so marginal that there isn't just much they can do about it. Now there are, there are things, there are plenty of things that are happening. So take say community-based radio, which is sort of outside the system. I was going to ask That's you about that and about the internet, which has certainly got pretty open access at the moment. Well, the internet is a, like most technology, is a very double-edged sword. Uh, it has, like any technology, including printing, it has a liberatory potential, but it also has a, uh, a, to a, a, a repressive potential. And there's a battle going on about which way it's going to go, as there was for radio and television and so on. About ownership and advertising. Not, and right, and about just what's going to be in it and who's going to have access to it. Remember, incidentally, that the Internet is an elite operation. Uh, most of the population of the world has never even made a phone call. You know, so that's certainly not on the Internet. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it, it does have democratizing potential. And there's a struggle going on right now as to whether that's going to be realized or whether it will turn into something like a home marketing service and a way of marginalizing people even further. That discussion went on in the 1920s over radio. And it's interesting how it turned out. It's went, uh, it went on over television. It's not going on over the Internet. Uh, and that's a matter of popular struggle. Look, the, we don't live the way we did 200 years ago or even 30 years ago. There's been a lot of progress. It hasn't been gifts from above. It's been the result of people getting together and refusing to accept uh, the dictates of authoritarian institutions. And there's no reason to think that that's over. You've been portrayed, and some would say occasionally portrayed yourself as a kind of lonely dissident voice. You clearly don't I feel do lonely at all. I say nothing like that. I, I certainly do not portray myself that way. I can't begin to accept a fraction of the invitations from around the country. I'm scheduled two years in advance. And at that, I'm only selecting a fraction of them. And you're There's speaking to big huge audiences. Overflow, huge audiences. And these are not elite intellectuals, either. These are mostly popular audiences. Uh, I, I, I probably spend 20 or 30 hours a week just answering letters from people all over the country and the world. I, I wish I felt a little more lonely. I don't. Of course, I'm not on NPR. You know, I wouldn't be in the mainstream media, but I wouldn't expect that. Why should they, uh, why should they offer space to somebody who's trying to undermine their power? and to expose what they do. But that's not moment. Professor Jobski, thank you very much. <laughs>